Paul, how's the practice doing? Great. Who's next? No one today. Calvin's office is not the same as a hot pocket. I'm going to prove you wrong, and you're going to owe me. How's the apartment search? You found something? Not yet. Why don't you just move in with me? What time's your first victim? Oh, 10 minutes ago. enormous Aubrey we're not doing wow. don't worry we're not doing I'm not gonna ask you to do karaoke <laughs> okay. Although, turn around every now and then I get do you know <laughs> did you see that video no you have to watch it uh, it is a viral video uh-huh Google of this comedian I don't remember her name she has an Italian name but it's easy to find it and she does 37 different impressions of singing that song <laughs> yeah but like all the divas i might have the number a little big but, uh -huh. but it's it's you have to see you'll you will love it oh my god you can even watch it without being high and giggle <laughs> all, you'll giggle all the way through um, I, I will definitely giggle i'm gonna write it down for you because it's so entertaining <laughs> well i met you uh, i think originally um when we we go way back uh-huh um, well when that was that rerun and you were there and i, I introduced myself i think yes Right. I don't expect you to remember all this stuff, but it no, was, I do. I was there because I had already seen um, Hump Day and My Everless Brilliance and was a big fan. Uh huh. And then you uh, and then had I, a screening, and Sean was there, and who else was there? Was it just ben. Sean? Ben. And Ben, right? <laughs> Look at that, Lynn Sheldon. And I, I only felt bad I didn't have a copy of Hump Day, or I, I might even. I just Josh is like the nicest. Oh. Guy. Oh my God. Tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. He was telling me about how how he was cast in this whole series of incidents mm -hmm. and I did not remember that he was in Please Give which is one of my favorite comedies. I love that movie so much and I had just seen yeah I, so I don't know how much he told you I'll probably be repeating the whole thing That's but fine. I just saw I had just seen Year of the Dog weird mm -hmm. film directed by Mike White written and directed by Mike White okay who's normally you know more who's known more as a writer yeah. And then this was his directorial debut. And he's also, he's the behind Enlightened on HBO. Anyway. Oh, I love that show. Yeah, he's With, a uh, genius. He's yeah. really great. And this movie is so great because nobody else could have made this movie, you know, and that's the, the that's dog. what I love. Okay. Year of the Dog. No, it not. stars Molly Shannon and Josh Pice plays her boss. And it's just, it's not, she. he's not on screen that much, but it yeah. is, he really made an impression on me. <laughs> I was like, you are... Yeah. So funny, sir. Who the hell are you? And then I met him after this Please Give screening Tribeca. at Tribeca, and I just completely geeked out on him. Yeah. And then he found out who you that were. I directed Hump Day, and he totally geeked out on me. It was so fun because he'd been very like, you know, oh, well, you know, he's very nice and sort of tolerant and s right. sweet, you know, and then he just was like, what? Yeah, directed Hump Day. It was mm -hmm. so great. And by the end of the evening, we were like, well, we have to work together. We just yeah. have to. And so, and then two years later, it took a while. But um, yeah, we just kept in contact. We Skyped, you know, and stuff. And right. it, was, it was really great. And it was, I had this other idea for a film and it just never, I could never quite get the, you know, story to gel. And so it just kind of got put aside and it made me sad. And then when I started working on this, I realized, oh my God, here, Paul needs to be in, you know, this guy right. needs to be in this movie. And then I turned him into. So you tailored it for him as you did. For oh yeah, him. it was written for him for sure. And, and um in fact, I was supposed to make another movie, a movie I finally just shot a month ago, um, but that movie got pushed, and I had to get on set again. It had been a year and a half, and I was like, I gotta get on set. And so I had this movie idea. It wasn't quite fully formed yet, but I knew I had enough time to finish writing it. But I had to have Rose and Josh, because those those characters were were absolutely, you know, had to be played by those two actors. So I called them up first thing, and if they hadn't been available, I, I would have waited. I would have shot something else. Wow. Um, but I really, I couldn't just recast those parts. Like, I really needed them to be uh, in the movie, and they were available. And then I finished writing it, and I started to fill in the other roles. But the roles were really written, you know, before I, act, I asked the actors. Yeah. So... Um, I just looked for the right people, you know, and it, and then Ellen was just perfect. And I happened to, the thing that was really interesting about that, it was very fortuitous. I don't know if I would have necessarily thought of her, but my friend Catherine Keener, who was originally going to play Alison Janney's role, 
she kept wanting to get us together. Like she was like, you've got to work with Ellen. You've got to work with Ellen. Cause they were very dear friends. They are very dear friends as well. And she sort of sat Ellen down, made her watch your sister's sister under duress. And, and then Ellen really, she really responded to it. And we got on the phone and she was just like, I know I pit, she was like, all right, pitch it, pitch yeah. it to her. They were like in a car as Catherine was in a car. was like, called me and said, okay, I've got Ellen here. You got to pitch the movie. <laughs> like, okay, no pressure. Of, well, this is still at a point where Catherine was going to play your. Yeah, like, it was, ra- it was a right. Your, your massage therapist. Yes, yeah, right. right. It right was. Through. And then after, right. and then we got, we got closer and this Thank other you. project that she was attached to was yeah. happening. And so she had to bow out very sadly because I really, really, really want to work with her as well. Right. But she but then, you get, then you, you said, you've got to get Allison. This other actress that, uh, helped <clears> yeah, a little, uh, yeah, she just at works. the start. She never works. And yeah, it was, it was a nice opportunity for her. Oh my God. That was, it was like having a goddess on my set. It was, she was just amazing. She's amazing, that woman. So amazing. Oh. So you had a sense that uh, Abby... We were talking about Allison Janney just now, by the way. Right, I don't think we even you. said her name, so I thought maybe we should just be, clarify. <laughs> right, thank you. In my introduction, <laughs> Allison I, I Janney would have included is a her. goddess. Yeah. In my conversation with Paul, we did to ripple in the story through, through the uh-huh. conversation, though I don't. This is a film essentially about two siblings. Uh, one is going in one trajectory, the other is going in another direct trajectory. Too. Yeah, in simplistic terms, you could say one person has, Rosemary's character sort of has her mojo at the start of the film and loses it, and he doesn't have any and gains some. Um, but then, but it becomes, it's it's more complicated than that, and their right. journeys, it, it, you know, they're both led on journeys of des- self-discovery, seemingly kind of in the opposite directions, but then they kind of join at some point and yeah, he kind right. of goes back down. Yeah, there's sort of a weird a weird convergence that yeah, happens. Both of their journeys in the film, Touchy Feel, have to do with touch. Mm-hmm. Uh, Abby, played by, uh, again, Rosemary uh, DeWitt, is a massage therapist. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden becomes um, a phobic about touching her clients and then and it freaks her out. And it's, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot more what, what's freaking her out. And then you have Brother Paul, who is a recent widower, Nice guess. She, he actually was uh, left in the dust. Okay. We, we never... Maybe it's, I forgot. It's fine, because I never... Obviously, if the exposition was important to me, then I would have put it in there, but... Um, nice guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But what happens, actually, the backstory is that is that his wife can't stand to be around anymore and just takes off okay, um, several banned. years before. Okay. And so... But it's basically, it's, it's sort That's of the harder. same effect. They never talk about her because right. she, her name is kind of verboten in the house. I mean, she just, she just left them. And he, and he already, I think, had this inclination. I mean, it's probably why she left right. because he's so sort of boxed in and, you know, clings to what he knows and doesn't want to know anything new and is just yeah. really not experiencing the world. It's just kind of getting by with, you know, um, in a very emotionally closed off way. And, and then I think becomes even more that way once the wife leaves because he's so hurt. And his daughter, played by Ellen Page, can't see herself just abandoning him too. You know, her mother has left and she could have gone with her, but she stays to take care of her, her dad and they develop this kind of codependent relationship because she kind of takes over. She kind of becomes the emotional replacement Ellen, for the wife. Uh, yeah. Right. But not only that, but she starts to really take on her dad's Dental. solemnity and his depression yes uh, which of course becomes an issue and something that's brought to his attention you know yeah that's very interesting to me that you have all this backstory for these characters and that I mean uh, maybe it's even in the original mm-hmm. script and it does make it into the screenplay i don't know but what's interesting is i think and i don't know if you ever had this conversation i think it's harder to be abandoned and left than mm. it, on, on some level psychologically than for the person to death to, to, has, been, the death has to taken occur, away well it's why suicide selfish, is but, so is so much harder to handle because it's kind of both. It's a real rejection. <laughs> You've got a real, yeah, exactly. It feels like, you yeah. know, how can you not feel, you're feeling abandoned because this person has been, is like, but also they're actually dead. So you've got the double whammy, yeah. you know, right. and it's sort of tragic on, on both levels. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I agree with you. It's definitely, I think it's got to be, I mean, it never feels good to be dumped for sure. Yeah. There's a section of the center of the film which does get solemn, let's put or intense in some level, but let's not make a mistake. This is still 
there's a lot of comedy in this. I don't want to. I also don't want to give the wrong impression about the tone of the film. Well, it's good to know that it's not. You know, it's good not. To, I think it's good to not be expecting a complete laugh riot from beginning to right. end. And you know, at a certain point, I sort of thought it was going to be really like half and half. in when I was writing the screenplay, because it seemed to me like one. There were two main storylines, and I felt like Josh's storyline was going to be really there was going to be lots of room for humor, and the other storyline was going to be more heavy and sort of emotional and. And then when I was editing it, a, f- a friend early on said, you know, it's a drama. I think it's a drama and you should just embrace that. And I stopped worrying about making everything that had been on the page I thought was going to be funny, mm-hmm. you know, forcing it laughs out of it. And so I just sort of let go of the stuff that wasn't, wasn't I thought was going to be more humorous and I just let yes. go of trying to make it humorous. But the thing that's so interesting is I really thought I had a drama that was like had a few laughs in it. <laughs> but ever after every screening, I've had so many people the first thing they'll say to me is it was so funny. And I find that fascinating, you know. Um they'll say it was emotional, but it was also they find it very very funny. So you yeah, I never know. It's always more comedic. See, this happened to all of my films. I thought Your Sister Sister, I thought Hump Day. I thought those films were going to be dramas. You know, that they seemed like dramas to me and everybody labels them a, a comedy, you know, so it's it's interesting. Well, you're looking from the inside out. And I think a lot of what, you know, people see is That's true. You know, the, a lot of people the drama that I mean a lot of people see is, you know, pretty intense. I mean, try going to a documentary, you know, the try seeing the act well, that's killing true. and then go see your movie. Yeah. You what know, was it? it was all well, by the way, before I forget, um the one other thing for me is having now seen I think all your films I love the cameo, so I wanted to mention it. Yeah, Basil you know, was there. Basil Sean Nelson Basil. was there. Alicia Del Moro played the right. wife, Alicia Anna, in yeah, in uh, in Hump Day. Who else is in yeah. there? Kate Bailey, who has a very a smaller role in um, actually a couple of movies. She's in Your Sister Sister as a waitress, and she's the stage manager in uh, in We Go Way Back. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it was really fun, and some new, all of those smaller roles, yes. including the guy who has he has a a, a fit. <laughs> Um, and and hy- hyperventilation, fall. he he falls. What? He falls. He bangs his head. Bangs his head. He's a fantastic actor uh, in Seattle. Wonderful, wonderful stage actor in Seattle. I've always wanted we'll to work with Hans Altweiss, mm-hmm. and his uh, wife Amy Thone is in it as well, very briefly. But she's one of the patients that he heals, and she mm-hmm. looks up at him and puts her head on his stomach. It's like one of my favorite moments in the movie, and she just just did it. Like she just found the, a way to convey her emotion in the most moving way so I like drop the score down to sort of a heartbeat you know percussive moment and it let it play out and it's just it's so wonderful to be able to utilize this local talent speaking of local talent I have to talk about working with Toma Nakayama I talk about how I created two roles in the film for the actors and I always leave out I don't I don't always I try not to try to remember not to leave out Tomo the character of Henry who ends up singing a song in the film oh of course thank you he was written specifically for Tomo because I saw this young man sing um, in in a beautiful former, it was a space that was a former church and has incredible acoustics and now it's a performance space called Fremont Abbey in Seattle. And I saw him sing during an a cappella show and he was the show-stopping end of the show and he sang this Judy Garland song, The Man That Got Away. And it was unbelievable. I mean, my whole body was just thrumming. It was so beautiful and exquisite and sort of transcendent. And I thought to myself very firmly, that voice in this space is going in a movie of mine. And not only did it get into a movie of mine, but it's also pretty much the catharsis of the film. And he wrote, a, uh, basically wrote that song for the movie. Mm. And the the lyrics just work so beautifully to tie all these different narrative threads together. And I mean, and then, you know, and he was basically, he's a musician yeah. and I wrote a part that I hoped wouldn't be too beyond his kin, you know, and he, and he, I just thought not only does he get by, he really, he's really good. I think he, all of his acting, I love all oh, of his acting in the film. It. So natural. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I can get the song and, and um, wrap the show with it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's called Horses. But the, yeah, whatever the most acoustic version is what you probably would want because that's what sure. you, know, you get I'll, in the I'll, film. I'll but figure out how to do it. In cool. Case I can. Great. Uh, there's so much more to touch on. Uh, so it's just the way it is, I suppose. Uh, one of these days we'll just... T- Maybe do this. Talk for hours. <laughs> well, <I'm, laughs> I could do that 
but, but you know, even <laughs> you mentioned one other thing, uh, which was you said you were working on something new. You just shot last month. Yeah, it's a film. I'm not even going to say the name because I don't think it's. No. I don't think we're going to keep the working title, so okay. I don't want to get pe- it, the wrong name into people's heads. But it's a it's a film about written the first film I've ever directed, written by somebody else. The screenplay originated from somebody else, and then I certainly put my paw prints all over it. But sure. you know, it really came from this woman, Andrea Siegel, who's this wonderful young writer in LA and um, originally set in California and I reset it to work in Seattle and it works beautifully and I was so happy to be able to bring a multi-million dollar production to Seattle and to the film community there and um, you know biggest crew most expansive film I've worked on Kira Knightley is at the center With of it the she's in every then. scene yeah exactly sorry. but for film yeah, no, for yeah. sure say who, okay, sorry who is in uh, Kira Knightley Kira is Knightley. the star she's really good she's actually. fantastic and Chloe Moretz is also is her co-star, the young Chloe Moretz, um, incredibly Kick-Ass. talented in Kick-Ass and Kick-Ass 2, and Carrie, um, among many other great films. Mm-hmm. I just finally saw the American version right before working with her of uh, Let Let Me In is what the American version of. She's so good in that. And that, that whole movie is great. The, the I was really and impressed. The, and the remake are both Yeah, fantastic. really good. Yeah. And Sam Rockwell, who was uh, absolutely lady. exquisite to work with, but also Ellie Kemper, um, Jeff Garland is in it. Wow. Um, I'm forgetting somebody very important. Mark Weber. It's really, it's an amazing, again, I'm just pinching myself having gotten to work with an incredible yeah. cast. Well, maybe when that time comes around. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope but, so. We're in the yeah. middle of editing and um, it'll it'll be premiering some sometime somewhere in 2014 if all goes well. Well, Touchy Feely is the movie. And it's opening in New York on September 6th, I believe. Yes. And then in L.A. a week later. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sure in a bunch of other cities, including, I'm sure, Seattle. Yes, uh, and if all else fails, yeah, it will be, it's available on VOD and well, iTunes as well. Right. But please all. see it in the theater if you yeah, can. Yeah, sure. If, it's, if you have one, that's plenty. And yeah. Thank you very much. Thank great. you, Adam. Nice to sit again. This is like <laughs> kind of cool after a while. <laughs> I actually know somebody over time. Um, yeah. Clients for the time being. What's going on with you? I don't know. I feel really weird. Hey, Jesse. Wow, that is not a hot pocket. God, you, you really didn't. No, it's nothing. It's totally not anything, you know. You should get Reiki done. Just climb on up here and get comfortable. That looks actually really comfortable, but I should have been more specific. Jesse asked me to move in with him. I don't want him to touch me. I can't connect. Why don't you come over here and I'll give you a back rub? I don't know. Hi. Abby's not here. Do you want to go maybe see some music with me? Very good. Well, first of all, you know, I think I got a little bit complacent when I went to see Touchy Feely. I'd come from a place of complacency in in the sense that I have seen all of her films at this point. Even, you know, we go way back, I think. And so when I went in there... You know, you go in, there's going to be, oh, it's going to be comfortable, and you're going to enjoy, and the characters are going to make you feel good and all that. Right. And the film actually was much more prickly than I expected. Just, I thought your character, Paul, was totally unpredictable. Like, I hadn't, I just couldn't have predicted that the character was going to... Go on that journey. Yeah, at all. Like, okay, he's kind of like the mopey guy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think in the beginning of the film... You might even think he's going to be a secondary character, and then it ends up being, you know, yeah. Well, he's not the ju- talking, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't talk. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he'll talk, but he, if if there's something that comes at him that he, mm-hmm. um, that's he doesn't know how to deal with or he's uncomfortable with, he just withdraws inside. And that's the majority of the wor- the life, his life. Right. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, at the beginning of, you know, his journey, he's um, he's holding on very tightly to, yeah, you know, exactly. like a narrow thread, and basically, it's a guy that wants every day to be the same, wants no inconsistency, wants no fluctuation, and, um, you know, and throughout as the story unfolds, uh, I get, you know, my character gets the ability to heal people. And that just opens up this whole door to him. And it's really a story, you know, from, or Paul's story is about going from being, in a sense, dead in your life to being present and, and alive. You're, you're a dentist, and the business is kind of uh, lagging, to say the least. Your daughter, Jenny, uh, played by Ellen Page, 
another lovely chemistry between the two of you. I, astonishing. Works for you in your practice, right? Yeah. What, what were you thinking about, before I forget, um, how empathetic were you uh, as Paul in terms of being the dad and of that character, of, of Jenny's character, of Jenny, and seeing that she was becoming a depressed, solemn, I mean, she was already solemn, but she was right. becoming depressed and over, overwhelmed by her own anxieties. And I wonder if, how you... Well, I think, you know, from Paul's point of view, you know, he, his wife left, he's definitely, there's no significant female in his life. And in a sense, he latches on to his daughter, Jenny, as a way to maintain some kind of a sec- security. And maybe, you know, we talked a lot about what is codependence, and I guess that's an element here. It's like he's desperate to keep her close, and I don't think he sees any of her anguish. I really don't, you know, there's a scene, you know, later in the movie where Rosemary DeWitt, who plays my sister, you know, confronts my character about, like, can't you see what's happening to her? And I think very genuinely he doesn't see because that's the perspective that he lives out of. Right. He's, he's so, um, I don't think he's of him as a narcissist, but he's... No. No, but he's definitely just uh, entirely taken up in his own sense of, uh, of loss and uh, depression and to the point where he can't see you. And it's interesting, too, because he also immediately... He wants to have Abby back in, who's, you know, Rosemary's character, right, right back in the house in a way of kind of reaching out. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me what, what his, why he wanted her to move in back Well, in. I think he, Scoot McNary plays Rosemary DeWitt's boyfriend in the film. And I think Scoot's character is a, you know, he's like a, a biker, you know, a bicycle biker. And he works in a, you know, bicycle shop. Your head. He's a gearhead, gear yeah, gearhead, and doing. and he's kind of a you know very open and free spirited and spontaneous, and emotionally and, available, and, and emotionally available, and really almost the most centered character in the film, and in some ways, and you know, Paul doesn't know how how to deal with that person, and so it's almost like he wants Abby, mm-hmm. you know, w- w- when they're talking about moving in together, you know, Paul suggests, why don't you move in? with me and Jenny, which is from Paul's perspective, like totally logical, but on another perspective, it's so odd, you know, that a brother would say, you know, no, move in with me instead of moving in with, um, your, you know, your boyfriend. Right. Yeah. So in a way it does make sense. Um, from Paul's perspective, it yeah. makes, it's totally logical. Yeah. All right. So we know then that of course, for whatever reason, there is this, um, it just so happens that you, as your, as the dentist, purportedly heal someone of their, you know, TMJ or whatever it was that yeah. having some neurological problems, right? And um, and then that sort of sets off a, a bunch of... Yeah, then... I don't want to get into you know, too much detail about it. But then the practice, yeah, basically, the, yeah. practice blows up. Yeah. Simultaneously, we should mention also that uh, Abby, again, Rosemary's character, is also going through her own trajectory at the same time, which is sort of almost like the opposite direction. It's yeah. That she's uh, and going through. And it's all about healing through touch, right? Yeah, and just really, just that sense of being, of being touched and being uh, able to receive, you know, the sensation of being touched and also to what happens as, you know, as you touch someone, like, can you feel them as you touch them? And it, with Rosemary's character, she's a massage therapist, and all of a sudden she sees skin as this weird kind of living organism and how Lynn Shelton, you know, how, how she shot that, the images of skin is just, creepy. it's creepy and it's yeah. a, kind of a foreign land. Yeah. And Rosemary starts out in the movie fully alive and spontaneous and as she can't deal with touch, it's like she goes on a downslide yes. as Paul is going on a Upslide. upslide or sliding upward, sliding yeah. upward yeah, and yeah. coming you know paul becomes more alive and she you know goes more inward and is mm-hmm. is more it's an interesting it's really an interesting you know juxtaposition of these siblings right right it, right and as you said earlier we, we realize that this is as much your story and uh, than it is um abby's story yeah which is a, a lovely but natural 
didn't feel like a deus ex machina, you know, the kind of forced kind of thing that sometimes happens in films. Yeah. So what is um, your background as far, I know you've done some t- uh, quite a bit of, uh, of television and obviously film and, um, you know, I'm so utterly prepared all the time that I, I, um, <laughs> I know everything you've done. Oh, you're, we're in Safe Men. Was and I started was out as, as uh, Raphael in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That was my first oh, big... Oh, very good. That was very my good. first big movie. Uh-huh. It's, is that, does that haunt you? Um, <laughs> there that, were, there, for whatever reason, there was a period of time where I just... Because the, the movie was so big. Oh, enormous. And, yeah, and people were like, you were Raphael? And I don't know, for whatever reason, I... Um, I don't know. I just kind of couldn't own own that, or I didn't want to own it, or I was like, no. But I do, you know. I've done all these other movies, and sure. But now it's like I'm just now I'm yeah, man. I was Raphael. That was uh, awesome. Yeah, Yeah, it was an amazing experience. It was a great, you know, intense, you know, working with an eighty pound costume and losing five pounds of (laughs) you know before from breakfast to lunch. We you know we would lose about five pounds and just eat and. I was ripped. <laughs> so that led to that short time where you were doing porn, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. Which was great. I it was doing was turtle amphib- porn. <laughs> Amphiba porn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but so this was this your first, you know, this level of independent film, which is where there's a, a maybe a small number of filmmakers like Lynn Shelton now that are kind of doing these w- widely distributed but still very small independent films. Well, I mean, I'm also on this uh, Showtime show, Ray Donovan, um, which is, you know, which is playing now. Um, and I play, you what know. What season is Ray Donovan? Uh, Ray Donovan is in its first season right now. Oh, it's what, so, so for the elite subscribers of the uh, premium cable. Yeah, that do so. not have uh, Time Warner. Right. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. an amazing, I mean, it's, it's an OBC, amazing yes. show. It's it's an amazing show. It is, what is, t- t- just tell me a little bit. And I, again, I apologize because I'm I interested. Yeah. And, I lo- and, I, and now I'm like your biggest fan. So Okay, good. For what it's worth. So uh, I play on Showtime, uh, on, yeah. on Ray Donovan, I play a character named Stu Feldman, who is, I run Paramount Pictures, and it's a guy that has, that has yeah. tons of power and all the toys, and, but really is kind of a mess on the inside, you know, which causes him to want to manipulate and control people. He's and poisonous. He's, he's trying to get some sense of acknowledgement for himself, and he doesn't know how to get it, even though he has all the money and all the power. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting. And, you know, Liev Schreiber and John Voigt are, you know, the leads of the series, and they are amazing. Like, John Voigt is off the hook. I mean, what he's doing in that show is yeah. phenomenal. I also think it's Liev's best work. Yeah. It's a great show. Well, I hope it helps their careers. That would be nice. That would be nice if it could help them. Yeah. But the, you know, the, process with um, Touchy Feely, how that came about was uh, I was in a movie called Please Give, uh, Nicole Holofsner's uh, uh, Yeah, of course. Movie. Uh, I, I, uh, that was terrific uh, uh, about the uh, Oliver uh, Platt. Yeah, and, uh, Catherine Keener. Catherine Keener, right? There are a couple of, of sort of well-off um, you know, Upper West Siders who feel guilty all the time about yeah. all the things that they've accrued. and missed. Right. And <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. And, and so that filmmaker who I just Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so there was a, it was playing at Tribeca Film Festival, and yeah. you know, we, we left and I was walking outside, and this very beautiful woman came up to me and said, yeah, I'm such a big fan of your words. Yeah. I know all you, I've seen all your movies and blah, 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 and I was just incredibly flattered. And you know, we ended up walking down the street, you know, a block and a half or so, and then I said, you know, wh- what do you do? And she <laughs> said, uh, I'm... Uh, Lynn Shelton and I'm I direct you know I'm a director and I had just seen Hump Day, Hump Day and I was like was I was like uh, and then it was like wow. totally back at her like totally yeah you know I just so we you know there was like a little cast gathering for um for Please Give and Lynn came and and we just like talked you know all night and we were just like you know we have to work together. And we began Skyping because she's in Seattle and sending emails back and forth like, what if it was this? What if it was that? And just kind of brainstorming about what, you know, a story that we could do together. 
and uh, and then we both, you know, when you know she was directing another movie, I was you know working on TV and and film, and you know some time passed, mm-hmm. and then and Lynn also had an idea for this Rosemary for Rosemary DeWitt to play this massage person that couldn't deal with bodies anymore. And then, you know, Lynn in a genius way kind of inter, you know, connected these two, what we had talked, a version of what we were talking about and what she, her idea with Rosemary. And Lynn called me and said, you know, first of all, are you available, you know, in May? And, and then she just told me, you know, I was trying to write it down and kind of keep up with it. She just told me the entire story of the film and, you know, I, so she wrote it for you. Yeah, she wrote it. For you. She wrote it for me and for Rosemary. That's that's great. And yeah. Had you ever met Rosemary before? Or? I had not. I was a fan of her work, but I had not met her. Right. Okay. And yeah. then Ellen Page came on, and, and actually Catherine Keener and Ellen are good friends, and and Lynn and Catherine are good friends, and I know I also know Catherine from Please Give. Yeah. And Catherine was with Ellen and and said call. Um, get on the phone right now with Lynn Shelton and 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 so because Catherine thought that um, that Ellen would be the perfect person to play my daughter and so they had a conversation so then Ellen came on board and Catherine initially was going to play Allison Janney's role which she's she's basically Abby's uh, Reiki yeah and, and, and guru Reiki guru yes which which you end up connecting with on some level that's uh, one of the subplots right and then Catherine went she had been waiting to do a movie suddenly the money came in so she went off you know for a directing uh project and and then she said put you know you got to have allison do this so yeah. Catherine was like a, a casting casting director and that's a lovely series of of a happy accidents and otherwise like to to make this cast because say what you will but this cast works together like a machine in, in, in a you know very very casual way but it you know that's not an accident yeah and Lynn, you know, creates just the most amazing environment on set. We also, Lynn and Ellen uh, and myself would have a lot of phone conversations about the relationship and about um, what, you know, codependency is and just the dynamics and the history. And then also Lynn and Rosemary and I had extensive phone conversations all before we were shooting because we were all in different states. And it just created this depth and a, f- and a familiarity. And, um, and then Lynn had a dinner where we all met up in L.A. And Lynn cooked for us. And throughout the movie, there's f- kind of very significant meals. And so, you know, we all just, uh, y- you know, hung up. Yeah, bonded. And I thought at some point we were going to talk about the movie or talk about. But it was just Lynn. We just hung out. She just had us ice. all. Yeah hung out and it just by the time we got to shooting there was a real sense of connection between everybody so this rumor i hear about her not allowing bathroom breaks on the set that's just not probably true um the the door has to stay open that's, oh that makes more sense yeah the door stays open anytime right. anyone just to keep that sense of connection right and openness and yeah we don't want any closed doors that makes sense yeah so that's great um the film is coming out I guess a week from Friday, right? Uh, it's coming September 6th, 6th in New York. 6th, yeah. And then it'll be uh, a week later. It opens in L.A. Mm-hmm. And then wider. And then, yeah, God willing, everybody oh, goes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No. And uh, it's. I think it's already on demand. Uh, it, on, yeah, it's on demand on already. iTunes. Yep. Yeah. What do you make of, I mean, you work in television, which, of course, now everybody says is, of course, you know, the work. The golden the age. Writing. Yeah, it's yeah. the golden age. It's true. But... Uh, what is your feeling about films going on demand and on iTunes? At, like, you know, this. Do you think about the strategy that that now, like distribution companies are making with digital platforms? I mean, for me, you know, f- from the actor point of view, I kind I kind of love the idea that it opens in the theater first, sure, and that that's you, that that's the first platform, yeah, uh, and you know, and then spread out from there, but. A lot of, you know, the business numbers indicate that opening it either simultaneously on demand and in theaters or in Touchy Feely's case, opening ahead of time and then opening in theaters, that it almost creates a buzz 
you know, it helps if right. people are talking about it and then it opens in theaters, um, it can be like advanced promotion. That's true. Also, e even though I suppose this will make it into many cities around the country, a lot of films that are somewhat smaller don't, and yet do make it on demand. They get maybe into a handful of theaters, right? And I hope this makes it into a lot of theaters, but you never know. I'm sure Lynn is still it's still a struggle on some level. Absolutely. So for many people, uh, uh, you know, who may love this type of film, this is their only opportunity to see it. Might be um, on. I, on, on iTunes or on demand. Yeah, especially so in they more... Don't the, they don't, may, it, don't, may not have a theater. Exactly. That, play that in their hometown. Yeah, so in, on that level, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Just, you know, for filmmakers to get their work out right. in a broader spectrum. Television is great. <laughs> so you're sort of, you know, it's also, uh, well, these films aren't playing, but I do have good television, so I won't go, I won't, you know, I won't watch. Yeah. There's no reason to watch. Yeah. So they could, it's, a, it's kind of a interesting... It's yeah, we're in a the midst of a major shifts and it's it's exciting and yeah. and unknown or be interesting. I think even in five years from now, um, I think we're gonna the way we experience media is going to shift yeah. radically. Yeah, that's another I guess conversation in yeah. a podcast. Uh, listen, I thanks so much for coming in. And My pleasure. Up. You're a really nice guy and. Uh, so are you. Yeah, thanks. And I love, I, I just remind me, the, get, please give, because that really is one of, I saw the Tribeca 2 that same, same year, I was thinking it was three, three years ago, maybe. Well, what was, what role did you play, like Platt, one of Platt's friends? Or? Um, I played, I'm in the beginning of the film and at the end of the film, uh, I'm somebody whose uh, mother had died and I'm oh, yeah. selling her stuff and it's a scene with Catherine Keener. Yeah. And uh, and then she's guilt. She takes this pot that was in in the house and she keeps it. And then she feels guilty. And at the end of the film, she brings it back to me. Yes, I do. and I gotta see that again. That was a, it's a great a, film. It really is. Please give. And <laughs> as is touchy feely. So uh, hopefully, in your next project, maybe we'll get another opportunity and talk again. Oh, for I'd out. love to. Um, all right, man. All right. See you soon. Yeah. <laughs>